Hi, welcome back to the lab. So today I'm just going to go through uh, a really quick video, hopefully, and show you how to replace the attenuator, um, uh, sorry, the, the O-rings in one of these uh, HP attenuator modules. Um, the one I have here is uh, out of, uh, well, is one of the two modules that are inside of a uh, HP 8642B signal generator. Uh, and I did a video, a couple of videos a while ago on fixing the attenuator modules in this particular unit that I have. And uh, I just wanted to sort of go over what the problem finally was. Uh, and for reference, um, this one is uh, a 33321SD, but there are multiple variants of this with different attenuator um, uh, values, like resistance values inside the actual module. And this one has, if I remember correctly, it's a 5 dB, oops, 5 dB, 40 dB, and a 30 dB pad. Uh, but the ones in the actual uh, 8642B, I think they're a 10, a 20, and a 40 possibly. So it gives you 10, 20, 30, um, 40, 60, 50, and 70 dB. Uh, and there's two of those modules. So it goes down to, I think, a total of 140 dB or something like that for of attenuation. Anyway, um, so let's go and uh, show. I've already taken apart uh, the external cover. I've taken, obviously, the attenuator part off, the external cover off, the two end caps, and... <clears throat> um, yeah, so let's go ahead and, and um, I'm going to take apart this assembly here so I can actually get at the the, the, the plungers where the actual O-rings are, and we'll uh, show you how to do that. So to do this properly, you're going to need to have uh, an 8mm wrench. Um, you're going to need to have a number 0 Phillips screwdriver, a number 2, or I think a 2mm or a... Uh, 5 ths hex driver and it really helps to have a pair of tweezers because to grab all the bits and pieces all right so after we uh, you know, remove all the screws and everything here um, these two modules will come apart uh, just be careful there's a couple of things here there's a shield right here that can completely come out um, just make sure it's it's held in by, by um, a set of magnets on each one of these uh, relays but just remember it can come out so uh, the, it may sort of reposition itself and um, the other thing is each of these relays have two plungers and each of these plungers as you can see them are attached to the contacts here and here and then of course here and here um, just be careful uh, when you're pulling these out. Now, I've not found a really good way to do this other than just pull, so be careful. Don't just yank, but if you pull them gently, they'll just come apart. And what's going to happen is on the actual contact part here, and I'm sure this is not the ordained way to do this, but who cares? Um, it seems to work fine, and these don't get da too badly damaged, and you shouldn't be doing this like a thousand times anyway. Um, but the contacts here, the actual uh, attenuator contacts, or the, the, the actuators, I should say, pardon me, will flip in behind the bypass part of the uh, trace or the, the signal path trace here. Um, and that's okay. When you put them back in, they'll pop back out in the right place. So it's, it's all right. You can, you can do this without worrying about damaging them. All right. So once you get to this point, the issue happens to be in uh, the mounting O-rings. Well, one of the possible issues, I should say, happens to be in the mounting O-rings for each of these plungers. So if we just carefully actually I'll use a pair of tweezers you don't need to but I will pull these out it's like a little sort of um, bracket that they sit in and you can see the o-ring itself the two o-rings there on the end of the uh, piston and there's a small little uh, separation between the two of them and that um, and that is where that sort of that bracket goes in there so these o-rings are the things that will dry out over time and uh, potentially can cause you problems if they dry out and crack whatever they can stick and do all sorts of nasty things so uh, these are the things that we were, were going to replace now if you're really lucky these o-rings have already dried out and cracked so you don't have to really worry about taking them off you just pull them off uh, in my case i've already replaced these so it's a bit more complicated so i'm going to go take them off and then come back all right so we have our two o-rings here and we have our piston here quick note um, about these o-rings these are um, two millimeter outer diameter one meter internal uh, one meter, two millimeter outer diameter, one millimeter in inner diameter, and the ring itself is 0.5 millimeters thick. Um, I don't know if that's the exact specification. 
of the original ones, but these ones work really, really well. They fit and they seem to be almost, they look almost exactly the same. So that's what I used and I, they worked fine for me. And um, to look for these, uh, it may not be obvious, there you want to look for um, either watch or clock making uh, um, parts. And uh, these are actually used inside of uh, like wristwatches and stuff like that. Uh, you can get sort of a set like this, and I have more than I need, but of course, you know, anyway, it comes with the, the, the particular one here. I think this set was like $10 or something like that from off of eBay. So, um, <clears throat> so you can get them there. Uh, so to put these on, we'll just, I'll just hold that here. Uh, the easiest way that I found, of course, again, you should, a pair of tweezers really, really helps. And uh, you just kind of loop them over the back. and press it with your finger to hold it in place like that. And then just grab the front of the O-ring, oops, and of course I won't be able to do it now, and flip it over and on. And I'll do that again. And again, maybe there's an easier way of doing this, I don't know. Um, I've got pretty big fingers, so who knows? Maybe this is not the best way, and maybe there's a, a fancier way of doing this that's not as clumsy or error prone or whatnot, but I'm usually in a bit closer looking at this, so it's a bit more complicated to do on the camera, but there we go. And there we go. They're both, they're both on and ready to go, ready to put back. So at this point, you can go ahead and mount it back on. And of course, you have to do this six times for each of the attenuator, uh, sorry, each of the, each of the attenuator pistons. And make sure you get, uh, I won't be able to do this like this, but make sure you have an O-ring on both the top and the bottom of the, uh, the plate the, uh, that you're putting this on. It's actually really hard to do. There we go. We're having a close up. So uh, once this, once you've replaced all of these, then you can go ahead and start reassembling it back together. Quick note about reassembly: when you pull this apart, make sure you check something. Um, in this particular unit, like I said, there's a 540 and 30 dB attenuator. Of course, uh, other units may have different values here, and more importantly, this block here matches this block. Originally I didn't think so, but of course it must because the distance between these two contacts have to match the distance between the actual attenuator pads, uh, the, the contacts on each of these attenuator pads. So for example, if we go take a quick look, the 40 dB attenuator here has a fairly large distance between uh, you know, the, the pads here versus the 5 dB one, which is a very sh short distance here. So if you did what I did, um, which is buy one of these units to replace uh, all the electro electromechanical uh, parts inside, but you want to keep the attenuators. Well, you have to actually pull apart and keep this block too that matches the attenuator uh, block here. So just something to keep a note, uh, just remind yourself that, oh yeah, you need to do this. I, I would not recommend uh, pulling these apart. I would leave these pieces as are. Uh, which means you want to also leave these pieces. But of course, you can easily remove this, so it's no big deal. Uh, just remember to do that, because otherwise your pads will match up with the contacts and then it just won't work. I've reassembled the two modules. Um, the pistons are now poking up through the holes against the uh, actual um, uh, actuator uh, contacts. And um, the thing to remember here is uh, that when you put them together, the actual pistons behind here, uh, which are part of the actual relays, they need to be pushed all the way towards the attenuator block. And the reason for this is if you don't, you're not going to put enough tension and the, and the pistons won't be in the right place. You won't be able to uh, attach them correctly here. So I'm going to try and do this. Uh, this might be really hard to do, but I don't know if you can see that. Uh, here, I'll do it with this one here. So the piston head's right here. <clears throat> and the easiest way that I found to do this is to simply just grab the head with a pair of tweezers and try and move it from side to side, uh, usually on the inside path. Of course, I can't do it now because I can't do it on camera. 
And normally, the contact will simply fall into place. Oh. Okay, that wasn't really awesome, but... This part's fiddly. Oh, there we go. Uh, I found that after you do one or two, the other be others become much, much easier. Um, I don't know why that is the case. Maybe just because your muscle memory in your hands sort of gets a feel for where it needs to be. Um, there you go. So, just go and do that for all six of the attenuators, uh, pistons. Not pistons, but the actuator pistons. There you go. Like I said, I found that pushing them on the inside towards the sort of the uh, the center of the uh, of the mount where, where these where these are mounted is easier, but your mileage may vary. And there you go. So once all those are in, now you can go ahead and reassemble. Uh, all the rest of the modules, so you can put in the two, the clamping uh, screws here, the three screws that go on the other side uh, here, and, and then go ahead and reassemble the unit. So I'm going to so go ahead and start doing that. Um, again, just remember you, if you to match up the uh, pads at the right place here, so that they, uh, the contacts all match, uh, and then you should be good to go. So obviously before you reassemble everything, it's probably a really good idea to do a quick check to see if everything's okay. So in my case, I have, I built a small little, um, a little uh, device to actually uh, run one of these attenuators. Um, this is the uh, attenuator that I'm using right now that's in it. Um, but it's really simple uh, in this particular case uh, because I made it and designed it so I could do this. So I could simply replace the, or I should say, this back in like this. And um, if everything goes all right, aha, there we go. So that one works, that one works, and that one works. So those all seem to work correctly. Um, and by default, it starts up with all the attenuator pads uh, in, so that gives you the highest attenuation, so to therefore protect whatever device you happen to have plugged in. So um, a simple test circuit like this, and I went over this um, uh, in my video with, for the HP8642B uh, repair. I created a small little test fixture for one of these devices to verify that, that was, uh, the problem was one of these sticky, uh, uh, sticky uh, actuators. So, I mean, you can go ahead and build one of those circuits. I think it was like on a, bread, on a breadboard or something like that. It's really simple. These things are just simply, um, um, uh, you, put a, you put a voltage across two of the pins um, on here, and it just simply will actuate or, you know, there, there's, 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 a, there's a, I think, a common pin, and then there's a, 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 a pad in, a pin, a pad out pin. So if you provide, you know, you short it to one, it'll pad, bring the, the relay out. If you short it to the other one, it'll bring the relay in. One of those two. So that looks like uh, a successful repair. Uh, I hope yours goes well too, if this is uh, something you are gonna try and do. Uh, don't get frustrated, it's a little fiddly, so it takes uh, maybe a bit of time to you know, pull the thing apart and put it back together again. Uh, additionally, you may want to use maybe some additional lubricant on the actual piston uh, shafts themselves. Uh, those might get a little sticky too. And um, yeah, I hope everything goes well and you hope you repair them. These are rather expensive modules. So I think um, on eBay, I picked up that my two spares for about, I think, 30 or $40 each. Uh, not ship, I think it was like an extra 10 or $20 to ship them. So, I mean, they're, they're not cheap. Um, and they went up more than, you know, way more than that. So being able to fix and repair them is actually really, you know, cost, cost benefit, uh, for sure, especially for a hobbyist. And, um, and again, building this sort of a test fixture to be able to test after it's fantastic. And these are really nice because they're all digitally controlled. Um, you can find ones, and I don't remember exactly how the mechanically controlled ones are linked together. Um, but in any case, you can still keep the, uh, the pad mechanism here, of course. 
um, and to swap it between a mechanical and a, uh, uh, an, uh, an electromechanical uh, attenuator module, I think. Anyway, uh, I, don't, I don't have a mechanical one to, t to verify that with, but in any case. Um, in any case, these are really handy. You know, you have like a lab, um, uh, you know, programmable attenuator. I just have one, you know, I have some buttons on mine because I, you know, don't need it to be programmable. But, you know, in theory, you could easily hook this up to a small little microcontroller and then remotely control it and that kind of stuff. So, you know, nice for home automation and hobbyist automation. Kind of neat. So, uh, again, good luck with your repair. I hope this helps. And uh, keep on building things. Catch you later. Cheers.